Scripture lesson, let's just take a moment and pray for all grandparents, shall we? <laughs> Gracious and holy God, we ask that you give strength to all who care for and love all of your children. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, verse 5 to 19. It's the destruction of the second temple, and I'll say more about that in the sermon uh, foretold. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned in beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, and all will be thrown down. And they asked him, teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he. And the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will perish, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. May God bless to our understanding the reading from God's holy word. In the last couple of weeks as I was driving around, there was a radio program on about stone walls. And maybe you have a stone wall on your property. Hopefully you can picture one in your mind. There certainly are an abundance of stone walls in Vermont. One of the things I learned from this radio program is that most stone walls used to be about waist or thigh high, which sort of makes sense because I doubt cows were shorter back in the olden days and our stone walls are sort of low now. Stone walls sink over time. On this radio program, one of the folks who had done a lot of research on stone walls shared that some of them go down as far as two feet into the ground, and they're bolstered underneath the surface that we see by the stones that have been sunk. And the person who was doing this radio program said that when you're building a stone wall, you have to be able to use what's called positive and negative space. If there are artists among us, you'll probably know those terms. The positive space is where the stones actually are. And the negative space is the empty space, the space between the stones. The space that is empty and possibly waiting to be filled. And this person kept saying that over and over. To build a stone wall, you have to be able to use the positive and negative space. I'm really focused on the stones in our lesson from the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus is speaking at the beginning of our lesson about the stones of what's called the second temple. A little bit of history. The temple, that, again, that Jesus and the disciples were looking at is the second temple. The first one built by Solomon had been destroyed. And this temple had been uh, was, about, was going to be destroyed in the year 70 AD or CE, but during Jesus' day it was there, it was huge, it was impressive. And the folks who are 
describing and, and perhaps giving Jesus a tour of the uh, temple. We're, you know, we're remarking on the, on the massive stones and Jesus is like, well, not, not one stone will be left upon another. If you go to Jerusalem, and I know some of you have been there, one of the foundational walls of this temple remains. It's referred to as the Western Wall in the midst of the old city of, the Jeru of Jerusalem. And it's the supporting wall of the Temple Mount, which has remained intact, this one wall, since the year 70. It is one of the most sacred, if not the most sacred uh, spots in the Jewish religious and national consciousness because there is a belief held within Judaism that the divine presence has never departed from this space. Jews come today to the Western Wall to mourn the destruction of the temple. One estimate is that these stones are 100 tons. And they're so impressive that the folks to whom Jesus speaks this morning just cannot get their minds around the fact that someday this temple might be destroyed. Because for the Jewish folks with whom Jesus was interacting, the temple was the only place where God could be worshiped. It was the only place where God was present. As many of you, perhaps all of you know, the Baptist church burned down 12 years ago due to a faulty fan in one of the bathrooms. It was a total loss and it was devastating for the church and for many, many in our town. And after the loss of the church building, Chris and Kathleen Blackie, the ministers of that church, spoke about over and over about how much they missed the building. They mourned that holy and sacred space. But, and it's a big but, but God could be and would be and was and is worshiped anywhere. God was not confined to that building. But for the folks, again, that Jesus is addressing in our lesson this morning, that wasn't the case. Part of their belief system was that the temple was it. God wasn't to be worshiped anywhere and everywhere, but only in the temple. So when Jesus says, not one stone will lie upon another, his listeners are stunned. Where would they worship? How would they find God? I think that's exactly Jesus' point. God cannot be held, God cannot be grabbed, or snagged, or captured, or encapsulated. The invitation, and it's a shocking one for those first hearers of these words, but the invitation is to let go of that temple idea. And then our lesson goes on and Jesus turns away from the stones and he speaks of ominous and yet hopeful things to come. Things that will test the soul's endurance. And he says at the same time, will help the disciples to gain their souls. Jesus speaks of the soul as not fixed, but to be gained. And to endure all that will come will help the disciples to gain their souls. One theologian offers this definition of a soul. The soul is that inward capacity in which the divine and the human connect in a lifelong process of anchoring and maturing. That's a lot to get your mind around. The lifelong process of anchoring and maturing the connection of our human lives and divine connection. So I want to go back to the stone walls that I started with. In building a stone wall, you have creative, you have the creative process of using the positive space, the stones themselves, and the negative space, the space in between the stones, space that might yet be filled in a stone wall's case by maybe little animals or moss or something. So I invite you to consider that our souls are that space between the, fill, the, the building blocks, the foundational stones of our lives, the space in our minds and hearts and bodies that are, have room for God, for faith, for growth. 
I'm going to offer you some building blocks as I finish this sermon, some observations about the lesson that we have this morning and an opportunity for you to fill that negative space, that empty space within your own minds and hearts. I offer to you the lesson from the scripture lesson, the vivid image of the temple, the huge, massive, seemingly immovable temple which Jesus says will be destroyed. And I offer to you the history of the Western Wall of this temple that Jesus spoke of that still exists, stones a hundred tons in size. The tangibleness of this stone. I offer to you our New England stone walls. I hope you can picture (laughs) one in your mind. I think the closest one to us here at the church is actually at the church's parsonage. The rocks have to be placed carefully just so. And I offer to you that space between the stones, waiting to be filled. And finally, I offer to you that Jesus speaks of the soul not as fixed, but to be gained. The soul being the inward capacity in which the divine and human connect in a lifelong process of anchoring and maturing, requiring use of positive space, and most importantly, the space waiting to be filled. A colleague of mine asks, can we even begin to see the possibilities that God places before us? That open, empty space just waiting to be filled? Or are we so caught up in the world around us, the space already defined, the foundational stones of who we are and what we do and where we live and what we have? Are we so caught up in that that we can see nothing else? May God bless us all in our journey of gaining our souls as we seek to worship and follow our loving, holy, inspiring, and wonderful God. Amen.